So thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. Uh, and despite what you might uh, guess based on the uh, history of the chat, uh, this is not actually going to be a stream about uh, Polish uh, high-speed rail, something that sadly does not exist. Uh, rather, it's going to be about the transit cost project and uh, high-speed rail in the northeastern United States. So, um, the transit cost... Uh, so the Transit Coast project is kind of wrapping up. It's kind of wrapping up. Um, so um, for people who don't know, this is about, uh, it is a comparison of subway construction costs for which we are doing five deep dive cases. Four of them are already out, um, which are Boston, Istanbul, Sweden, and Italy. Not in the order that they were released. The order was Boston, then Istanbul, and Italy, same day, and then Sweden. Uh, in fact, speaking of Sweden, um, I'm going to talk about the Swedish case um, in a week. Uh, please do register on Zoom. Um, it's going to be a webinar, and I'm going to and, and I'm giving you the information how to get there as we speak. I just never remember the Zoom link, because the Zoom link is just going to be a, a random string of um, characters, right? I'm not going to remember a random string of characters. Like, asking me what the URL is for this video that I upload. Now, obviously, I remember the URL of my Twitch, but why would I remember this URL? So, it's here, um, and... Uh, you can, uh, and you can again grab it from my Twitter if you don't want to um, hand type these because you can't, you can't copy paste from, uh, you, you can't copy paste from this in Twitch. I'm about 99% certain that there's no way to do so. I do know that there, there, there do exist, um, I, don't, I don't know if it exists with um, browsers, I know that it exists with games, that some games let you as a Twitch viewer, not just view them statically, but also engage with the game. So um, the game Slay the Spire, it's kind of card game uh, roguelike. Um, the way that that works is, um, exactly. the way that that works is um, if someone that I'm watching on Twitch plays Slay the Spire, I mean, I can't participate in their game, but if I, I take my mouse as a viewer and I hover over the screen, um, over, let's say, a card or, or an enemy, it does give me some information about the card or the enemy as if I was the player, just so that I, the watcher, would be able to keep track. Um, I don't know if that is a thing that exists for uh, browser views, though, and, and therefore I'm not going to say that it's possible. So anyway, I just show you the URL. Please do register. Um, the you know, something. If you're watching this on... I have something. Um, if, uh, I mean, so let's, uh, let's copy. So if you're watching this on Twitch, oh, wow, I didn't realize. Um, oh God, no, this was not the intention. I don't want the t.co. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. If you're watching this on Twitch, it's going to be here. If you're watching it on YouTube, I mean, it's downstairs in the link anyway. Um, so this is in a week, and this is at, uh, and, and this is at, what's it called, uh, this is at 5 in the afternoon, uh, my time. So 5 in the afternoon, Sweden time, 11 in the morning if you're in the Eastern Goss, on Tuesday the 20th, the 20th of September. Um, so anyway, with, with that kind of shameless self-promotion, and what is my channel anyway, um, it's not going to be on Twitter, it's going to be on, web, on, on Zoom, so click the right thing, please. Uh, then it's going to... Uh, so, so the point is that this is wrapping up, okay? As I said, five cases we've done four. We're literally introducing the fourth. The fifth is practically done. Um, There's going to be a big, not just webinar, probably an offline event about it um, sometime in October. And therefore... Um, um, I've constantly said that what's next is a bunch of different things, and one of them is going to be high-speed rail. Um, and I've already done a little bit of work on stream as well, talking about the high-speed rail project. So 
Um, um, so I kind of want to start piecing things together and explain what we're going to need to do. And this means what I'm going to randomly talk about in the same way that last year I randomly talked about construction costs a couple of times um, as I started to understand what the issue was. Um, it just took longer to write, um, which I think is always the case. And the same is, I hope, not going to be too big of a problem with high-speed rail, the, um, and the final product. But um, so with high-speed rail, one, come on, not quite that. Um, with high-speed rail, the goal is to come up with a good proposal for fast trains on the Northeast Corridor, that is to say between Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. Um, and uh, now, outside proposals exist. I think the one that's best known is Penn Design. Penn Design, High Speed Rail, Northeast Car Corridor. Let's also spell Corridor like I'm not drunk. Um, and so you can check this. Um, I do have certain disagreements with what that design is doing. Um, there, there are a bunch of these. So there's Penn Design. There's also something called North Atlantic Rail, which is a New York and Boston thing. I think it used to be called um, New York, New England or something, or like, or like High Speed Rail, New England. And then they changed the name to North Atlantic Rail because New Yorkers are not going to be interested in anything that is called New England. This is what I was told was the reason for the rebrand. And... Um, the idea is to do something that is maybe more technically informed and technically informed specifically by best European practices. Um, to some extent, also by, by best Asian ones. I'm much more informed about how Europe does things in Japan, South Korea. I think that the specifics of the Northeast make... Uh, Germany and especially the smaller countries adjacent to Germany, um, which I mostly mean Austria, Switzerland, and uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, less so. Um, a very good um, uh, set of examples to learn from. Not because they have cities the size of New York, they don't. I mean, if you want a city the size of New York, you go to Tokyo, you go to Osaka, you go to Seoul. Um, you can kind of squint your eyes and say London and Paris, but London and Paris are relatively smaller than New York. Britain has no high-speed rail. It has medium-speed rail and is currently building high-speed rail at obscenely high cost. Uh, Paris has a specific, has a bunch of specific problems that um, make it a, a, a useful thing to learn certain technical standards from, but please don't do the Parisian thing where um, the lines don't connect. Thankfully, it's not something that's going to happen in the Northeast just because the Parisian terminals are terminals. So um, the, the DGV did not invent the part where intercity trains depart six different stations in Paris, right? This is from the eight, this is how big city train stations were built in the nine, in the 1800s as well. And so um, uh, the lack of connections the TGV exacerbated them. I do think that in the 70s, when they were planning the TGV, they had a uh, once in forever opportunity to connect Gare de Lyon and Gare du Nord, um, and maybe also Montparnasse and Est, and build a Paris Central at Le Halle, um, while they were at the same time taking up the area anyway to build um, RER. Um, the, the RER station, Châtelet Le Halle, opened um, 77. The um, but they only did it as a commuter rail operation. They did leave some space for more mainline trains, but the mainline trains were tended to be longer range commuter trains. And then the RERD was built along this route um, later in the in the nineties. Um, at this point, if Paris wants a uh, Paris Central station, cannot go here. I mean, it's, there's too much stuff. They would need to probably dig a. They probably need to find space to dig up around Gaudino, maybe Gaudino. Um, so probably something in one of these places. Um, they're already having ideas about how to do urban renewal in the area. Um, which in, So in America, quite a lot of social activists in the 50s and 60s criticized urban renewal as a racist policy. The One of the nicknames for it was Negro removal. Um, 
And this is exactly what is happening in Paris. Essentially, the issue is that um, black people from the um, suburbs in the north and northeast um, go to Gaudino because it's convenient, and they loiter. Now, they don't actually bother other people except through their existence, but France being France, that is enough for um, centrist and right-wing politicians to already concoct grand proposals to reimagine this area um, around a higher class of um, person. And so the, uh, um, but, but at any rate, if they can find space, and again, they're, they're going to find space eventually because that was on the line forever, um, then that is something that separately could also be used as a Paris Central. I mean, they would still need to tunnel to the other stations, but um, that is doable. Just trains are never going to, I mean, if there's a central station, it's going to be not especially central. This is not a problem that American cities have. American cities were early adopters of something called the Union Station Movement, um, in which you have a station which is a union of different railroads. Um, and um, now, New York and Philadelphia did not have them. New York and Philadelphia did not have Union Station. New York had Penn Station and Grand Central. But Penn Station because it's new, that is to say, early 20th century, not legacy 19th, is a through station. And um, so in Philadelphia, 30th Street Station was built as a through station to permit through service from New York to Washington by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, in both cities, the competing railroad, so Grand Central, so New York Central for Grand Central or the Reading, stuck with the turtle. Um, but also the Pennsylvania was kind of uniquely, I won't say uniquely passenger, but I don't think the Pennsylvania Railroad was especially passenger. It was just huge. So it also had a proportionally larger uh, passenger rail uh, operation. I'm pretty sure that if you just think in terms of who is the passenger, yes, in relative terms among the traditional American railroads, um, Uday, if you're watching this, yell it to me if I'm wrong, but I imagine it would have been the New Haven, because the New Haven Railroad was a not particularly important freight railroad, but it did do, but it did do New York to Boston, and Boston to Albany. Um, so, the, so the point is that at least some of these mixed features are already avoided, the, the lack of connections, and, and the Northeast Carter do, does kind of force itself just by the state of the infrastructure to do relatively simple operations where the trains go back and forth. I mean, yes, you can have more local and more express trains, but you're not going to have very weird patterns where their trains are going to be skipping New York, whereas trains absolutely do skip Paris to go around. Trains skip Lyon to go around. Uh, trains between Paris and Marseille don't stop at Lyon. They um, go around it. Maybe they serve the airport, like the Lyon airport, but they don't serve Pardieu. Um, so, so these kind of, so that kind of misfeature, I mean, there's nothing to learn from it. There's also, but it's also impossible to learn bad practice. So, yay. Now, um, in contrast, there is a really important set of Central and Northern European practices, which is how to timetable trains on very shared passenger track. Now, why do I say passenger track when American heavy freight exists? The reason is that there's practically no heavy freight on any of these lines. Um, the Northeast Carter has been transformed into a passenger primary railroad. Um, it was not always like this. The, again, the Pennsylvania Railroad was not um, passenger dominated in any way. It was, it was just very big and therefore also had very big passenger ops. Um, and for, so for example, it built the Northeast Carter with four tracks. Um, when it rebuilt it in the late 19th century, the plan was to, to run the, all the passenger trains on the outer two tracks and the freight trains on the inner two tracks. Uh, and so express and local passenger trains actually share tracks. So um, redoing the operations in the second half of the 20th century so that the um, passenger trains would go on the inner track, which would be transferred into express tracks, um, that took some work, and the freight ended up getting moved. And I'm pretty sure the freight was already in decline um, anyway, um, and ended up moving to competing lines. I mean, the, there were multiple distinct lines, there still are, between New York and Philly. Um, so there is some freight, but it is not dominant. It can be timetabled around the passengers, 
Um, and if there's no timetable, then you just have regular slots. So that's not a big deal. And the upshot is that you can plan this purely around passenger needs. Um, but there are a lot of different passenger rail priorities because there is commuter rail. Um, and something specific is that um, you can do commuter rail as F1. Remember how I said Austria, Switzerland, the Netherlands, but not so much Denmark. That's the issue. Um, Copenhagen has a uh, has an S bahn tunnel has it has, has an S bahn service called the S talk but it runs on separate tracks. Um, it's an early S bahn from the 1930s, like the Berlin S bahn, um, the Hamburg S bahn, um, the later but still very highly segregated um, RER in Paris, um, and this is very difficult to effect in the Northeast. Um, now, if the intercity trains remain crap as they are now, then you can mostly ignore them for um, commuter rail planning because the speed difference is not very large. Um, here I'm going to go to the Transit Matters, not Slack, which would be a server error anyway, and, um, and I don't want to accidentally discover on stream, under record, what, what is being recorded that um, it's to, suddenly today not an error, and therefore you can read the internal uh, the, the internal communications of TM. So let's talk about the Providence line. Um, and let, let me see if I can find good graphics for it. Okay, yeah, we did do graphics. Um, the graphics are on the right, so I'm gonna be on the left. Um, yay socialism. So the Providence line is here, and if you're wondering the, what these represent, these are just municipal boundaries. So Boston, uh, Sharon, and so on, Mansfield, Alboro. Um, this is Providence, and, uh, and this is the state line. So the Providence line um, is uh, so I'm gonna call I call it Boston to Providence because it, practically all the trains run to Providence. A handful go beyond Providence, um, but very few trains, and also the ridership at these stations sucks. It's well below uh, projections. I think they were they, they built a garage with 1.2 thousand parking spots at Wickford Junction. Uh, let me show you what the Wickford Junction land use is. Um, I need to find the line, but uh, it's here and somewhere around here is Wickford Junction. Here, um, I imagine that just staring at this, you can kind of tell that this is not what very high uh, commuter rail ridership looks like. Um, and um, the and again, it was supposed to be to, like a collector parking lot for all of South County, and uh, it didn't come to be for reasons that I think should be obvious based on the land use. And uh, and and this actually drags Rhode Island's investment plans because, in the same way that the big day in Boston has been used as a, as an, an excuse not to build anything that involves a tunnel because what if it's the second big thing? Um, the failure of Wickford Junction, I'm pretty sure, I, I'm pretty sure they get 200 passengers a day. Um, I mean, I, can, I, mean I, I don't need to be pretty sure. I can actually check these because they have counts from not long before Corona. So Providence, to St so Providence and Stoughton line, and I guess I, I, it's a download that I already made, as you can see by the parentheses. One, like we, we, we looked at the, we, we studied these a lot when we wrote this. Um, so Wickford Junction has how many riders? Two hundred and thirty-five. They were expecting about five times as many. Um, and you can compare this with other stations on the line. Let me make sure you see that you can. You can't compare this with the other stations on the line because you can't see the names very well. 
Okay, no. Okay. Um, quick for junction. 235. These are just ons, not offs, but um, the um, but these are inbound trains, so flip them and you get the outbound. Um, and obviously you're not gonna get inbound. All you're not gonna get any offs inbound at the outermost station on the line. You can see they're practically not on the other side. This is very much just about getting people to downtown Boston. Um, the only stations with significant offs are um, downtown Boston and downtown-ish Ruggles. Um, so this is the ridership. Um, and I bring up the failure of this because it means, first of all, I can just plan Boston to Providence is the Providence line, and in an emergency, it's possible to sever the rest. It, the Rhode Island won't like it, but it's possible to downgrade the others to some kind of um, shorter train. And, and we didn't propose this in the study because it's not because of poor service. Um, the frequency is not great, but there are a bunch of rush hour trains, and um, a bunch of rush hour trains do get more ridership. I mean, remember that the old peak frequency at all the other stations is a train every two hours. So, um, so again, we did not talk about the possibility of um, cutting this from the line and reducing it to a more frequent but shorter train, I think is probably the, the best way to do it, um, with a lot more stops, because DF Green and Wickford Junctions are in River Junction or Dronk locations, there are uh, you could get more ridership literally here. So not downtown Providence, but um, maybe I should show it on Google Earth. Um, here, this would be uh, vaguely connected with Federal Hill, Hill which is here, um, and Olneyville, and then um, around Hartford, so here. Like literally, I mean, this can be. Um, and and the thing is, this is something that. Eventually, I mean, I mean, I don't know if there's enough space, could be even turned into a kind of proto S bahn, but it would be a, an S bahn with a lot of track sharing with other things, which would need to be timetabled around it, or it would be timetabled around them more likely, given about the ridership. So it, it's not something you can do like the Berlin S bahn, which is its own thing. It's something that has a lot of um, connectivity with existing commuter trains. For example, Boston to Providence, this line is two track. So this is a two track line. Um, so this needs to be planned around uh, overtakes, um, and there, uh, and, and because Amtrak does not know how to do a timed overtake, um, which is only they don't do them. They do them. There is a four-track overtake section um, at Attleboro, but they don't know how to use it well, and they don't know what it means to run on to run everything on the same clock face timetable. Um, the MBTA literally needed to get yelled at by TM to run. Clock face timetables. They don't run them. They don't run good clock face timetables, and Amtrak does not know what this is. Um, so the idea of doing this kind of planning and coordination, they don't know how to do it. And so what they're planning is from, I forget whether from Attleboro. I, I think most likely from this curve called Boston Switch. So from this curve up to Canton Viaduct, which is here. No, not here. This is Canton Viaduct, as, as the name I suggest, it's in Canton. The plan is to triple track this entire thing, which is a terrible plan. I mean, I shouldn't say terrible, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of, they're saying it's a waste of a couple hundred million dollars, but that was 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure the waste has been, the waste is at this point more than a billion, but it doesn't matter. It's a waste either way. It provides no transportation value whatsoever. Um, what they should be doing is, um, electrifying the local tracks at Alvaro because only the express tracks are um, for, for the commuter rail can use the local tracks. Um, the MBT is aware of it, and I think they might even have plans to do that. Um, electrify the Stoughton brand. Um, they want to run batteries the MBTA because they're stupid. Um, and you need a, and you and then you need to figure out the overtakes. So essentially, there are two ways to make this work with overtakes. The, the first is you do a second overtake around here. So that would be um, an overtake um, between Route 128, which is here, and Reedville. Um, so it would span two stations in order to avoid holding up the local for too long. Um, 
essentially the the local would be held either way. Essentially, you need to the local needs to be slowed down from being a train behind. Sorry, a train ahead of the express to a train behind. So that's four minutes of relative slowdown, and so we might as well extend the four tracks one more station since they're that close because then the extra station is going to be another um, minute something of extra um, slowdown, and then there's this station. So I think you don't need extra slowdowns in this case. I mean the you know, I mean, it's a little bit more money, but it's a short four-track section. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility is to think that maybe two overtakes on one line might be too fragile, and then just do one overtake right in the middle. It would have to be um, Sharon. Um, and it's just that it's... Oh, hi, Nu. Leaving. Um, and then if you four-track, Sharon, which is here, um, then again, it's just one overtake, but it's a more fragile overtake because both sides, I think maybe more north, south than north, you're going to be very, you're going to cut it very close. I knew. So, um, if you, so, um, the thing that I'm saying about the city you live in is going to be in a week. Um, and right now I'm just uh, geeking out about high-speed trains in the US, which do not exist, but could. Um, so, so the point is that, so the point about doing this plan is to, just again, figure out the different alternatives. In the last two videos, I already talked about um, the difference between a crayon, which is a kind of final plan. I mean, the sort of people who are mocked as crayonistas don't do it as a final plan, they do it as the only thing, like, this is what I want to do as opposed to these are the different options, let's evaluate them and then see which is the best, or maybe two that are kind of co-best, and then it, there are two options, and, and then maybe the final decision is going to be kicked up to politics or something. But um, the um, so the plan is the various options. So in this case, it could be how to do Boston Providence. Um, what are the good options for that? So full three tracking is a terrible option, or full four tracking is a terrible option. Not one... So, or rather, it's a terrible option at, a, at lower expected ridership. You should plan around lower expected ridership because high expected ridership prints mine. Um, the only things you should do, you should plan around high expected ridership from the start are things where it's hard to retrofit. It is not actually hard to four-track a line um, because you are going to work most likely overnight when there are no trains. Um, if it's next to the line, and if it's that difficult, you can just build a greenfield line, not exactly on the same right of way, but on a very nearby right of way. Um, so, um, so that's the first thing, and the second thing is that I don't think that 12 trains per hour, which is what a lot of these plans assume, is viable if you just high-speed rail this part. Now, if you high-speed rail the entirety of the of the eastern United States, then yes, this becomes viable as 12, and the reason is that. Um, is that full high speed rail like everywhere in the United States would be things like Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. So, okay, but that also induces ridership from New York to Pittsburgh, Boston to Pittsburgh. N New York to Albany, likewise, induces ridership, Albany to New York, and then you change trains and go to Philadelphia and Washington. Trains to Virginia um, and, and North Carolina, I mean, yeah, they go from Washington to, let's say, Virginia, North Carolina, and Atlanta. But especially in the, at the northern end, people are going to ride through to New York. So that induces more ridership here. And maybe, maybe in Virginia, we would even induce ridership to Boston. Like, high speed from Boston to Washington is about three and a half hours. So over here to, to Richmond, it would be maybe four and a half. Four and a half is viable. I mean, I don't think, it, I mean, think uh, people are still going to fly from Boston to Atlanta, maybe even Charlotte, but Richmond, yeah. So you might even see more ridership as far as, as, far as Boston. So, this is where um, it matters what system you build. And again, think ahead. Don't do things that make it impossible to expand, but don't do things that only are viable if you expand later. So this means, now, if you do 12 trains per hour, you absolutely can't do overtakes. Um, about, the, about the upper limit of what you can do with overtakes is six trains per hour, and that's going to be a very fragile timetable um, with the... Adelboro overtake and the Sharon overtake and Route 128 um, to Raidville. Um, and most likely, 
there would just be a lot of fort tracking between them. So let's say fort tracking between Attleboro and Sharon. Uh, and then, so that is like a long overtake and then um, where, where, a high, where fast train passes to slow trains and then here, I think that might be viable. Um, and again, that's another plan. I mean, so probably the plan should say in advance, we're planning around this kind of capacity. Um, we're maybe planning a little bit ahead. Um, so that would be what if you need six and not four, but we're going to talk about what, what to build to four. Um, so the idea is, you, again, you plan for the capacity that you need. Um, and remember that high-speed rail is operationally profitable pretty much everywhere. The subsidies are for construction. Often they're still paid for, they're still paid off by debt, like the, uh, not by debt, by, by, um, by profit that pay off interest on the debt. But, um, at least in France, which is where I've seen this the most explicitly, the rate of return, the, even the financial rate of return without social benefits, um, they always beat the government cost of borrowing. It's just that, the, um, is that if you've built the line, okay, the government went into debt to build the line. It's called the general government debt. And then the government is making money off the operation of the line. And yeah, it can use the operating profits to retire the debt, but maybe it's going to instead roll over the debt and um, use the operating profits for other things is the way it normally works. But again, on like fiscal, but, but the point is that operationally, this are profitable in the Northeast is very urbanized. These are very large cities with the kind of marginal lines where people are uncertain whether they're going to, uh, whether they're going to make money are lines that run a train every, like a short train every hour or something like that, because they're connecting Madrid with Basque country or, um, Orense or Alicante or things like that. And this is New York to Boston, New York to Washington. That's not where you're going to be worried about um, only being able to amortize your construction costs, which if that is Spain are still very low, but it's still only amortizing them over a short, uh, over a train with, with 300 something seats every hour. And this is a train, it's going to be a train every 15 minutes, maybe every 10. My, my guess is that they need to plan this around a train every 10 and this around a train every 15. Um, and uh, do that as a, uh, um, and, and then, and these are also not trains with 300 something passengers. These are going to be long trains. Um, and the Spanish trains are also low capacity for their size because the, uh, low capacity for their length because the Talgo power cars consume 20% of the train length. So it's, I believe, 330 or 350 passengers per train. Um, these would be about 1,100. 1.1 thousand per train. Um, and all of these passengers are going to be paying, I mean, not current Amtrak rates, which are horrifically expensive. Right now, Amtrak, I believe Amtrak charges something like 30 cents a kilometer on the regionals on the Northeast Corridor and 50 on the Acelas. The average for European high speed rail is about 10 or 11 euro cents per kilometer. Um, so it's about 15 American cents per kilometer. Um, but that's still, I mean, you're still making money. So, th so the point is that it's okay to assume the less favorable operating assumptions in this case, which are that, you know, um, would, how many cars are, how many cars, uh, am I planning per train? 16. Um, in fact, Japanese 16. So an integrally six. So most likely it should be an integral 16 car train and not a European 16 car train, which is two eight car trains um, coupled together. So they have four noses instead of two. Uh, would double decker trains make sense for the Northeast Carter? They are not. They do not exist for high speed trains. Um, they did exist. The Shinkansen did have double deckers, um, and uh, the uh, these are the um, E1 and E4 series. Um, first of all, they were limited to 240 kilometers an hour. And second, they were kind of lemons. They were retired and not replaced. Um, there is the TGV duplex. Um, this is a double decker train. It is also inherently low floor, um, like inherently low platform. Like you can't, um, they don't have split level. So, um, 
double-decker trains, they have a lower floor and a higher floor. Some of them also have a middle floor. It doesn't mean that they're triple-deckers. It means that there's uh, there's a lower sorry, a lower floor and an right, let me let me put my arms in a place that's actually visible on camera. Lower floor, upper floor, and then um, sometimes there are sections that are only single floor, usually at the ends of the car, so that people can so that passengers can walk between the cars. And also traditionally, the boarding height would be to a high floor, so the boarding would be to there. Um, especially important when the floors have been raised already. So, for example, a Dutch double-decker will board to the middle floor at the ends of the car because the Dutch platforms are 77 centimeters, and you can't do that as the lower level and then another level on top of that. You, you would the, the train would be too tall for, for, the, um, for, for the bridge clearances. Um, so these have split, level, split levels. American double-deckers um, that are used in the Northeast are also split level the, uh, um, for the exact same reason. Um, but France is low floor territory, 550 millimeters, not 760. I, forget, I may have said 77 centimeters. It's wrong, it's 76. Um, yeah, no, all, no. the, the Tegevets are all... Um, the, the, France loves its spy levels. It's especially like that they're domestic bespoke technology that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and, oh, oh, I didn't realize. It's, yeah, it would be very difficult for me to compare normally because the, when I think of integral 400 meter trains, I think of Shinkansen trains and integral for, and Shinkansen trains are generally cheaper. Trains in Japan are cheaper than here. Um, also about the larger loading, no, I'm assuming the exact same loading gauges in the United States, which is, um, because this has to use so much legacy rail infrastructure anyway, but the um, legacy loading gauge in the United States is only 10 centimeters narrower than Shinkansen, and I think 15 narrower than Chinese high-speed rail. I think Chinese high-speed rail, no, actually it might be the same as Chinese high-speed rail. I don't remember, but America, the American loading gauge is massive. Um, and this is actually creating problems with electrification, not real problems, but fake problems. The fake problem being that Americans are so used to Trains that are not so much wider, but also much taller than elsewhere, that they think that um, what are called low bridges in the United States, which I sadly only remember in uh, American units, so I'm going to tell you this in American units. This bridge height, 16.4, is considered too low in Boston. This is the low, these are the lowest bridges in Boston in the Boston area, and these are considered like obviously impossible to put wires underneath them. Um, spoiler alert, you absolutely can put wires underneath this. The Shinkansen height is 4.7, so 200 and so this would be 27.84 centimeters, which is almost exactly the electrical clearance you need to that kind of wire height. In Germany, it's 27 centimeters, so you have and this is the static clearance, not the dynamical clearance. So static clearance, so so so, you, so it's not, oh, well, what if the train sways? No, this takes that into account. Um, is there, I even heard that 17 feet times, uh, 17 feet 3 inches is hard. So that would be 5.25 meters. They think that it's too low for catenary because they're used to giant trains as opposed to Normal trains, by the way, are also run in the United States. Um, it's not like I'm saying, oh, we'll shrink the trains, and then you also and and, and, and they also need to move the uh, floor a foot down. No, you don't. Um, so, yeah, so there are things that are going to be in the plan. So, so you have to look at. Um, so, let me actually make this file. High speed rail project planning possibilities. Okay. So, um, capacity, um, New York, Boston, sorry, New York, Washington must be planned as six trains per hour. New York, Boston is four or six infrastructure north of New Haven, maybe 
and this also affects timetabling. Why? A train every, so six trains per hour is a train every 10 minutes. Uh, four trains per hour is a train every 15 minutes. 10 is not a divisor of 15. So what it actually means is that a train every 15 minutes, um, that maybe the trains are going to run every half hour, not literally train every half hour, but the idea is that you have, let's call them three patterns that repeat every half hour, and then between New York and Washington, they're going to be 10 minutes apart. And then maybe one of them is going to be a little bit slow. So maybe one of them just disappears in New York or New Haven, um, and then one runs a little bit slower than the other. Maybe it makes another stop, let's say in London. Um, let's say the changeover is done between New York and New Haven, not east of New Haven, I'm not sure. Maybe make Stanford as a stop or something, or New Rochelle, and then east and to the point so that east of New Haven, or at least east of New London, they are spaced 15 minutes apart for the overtakes because Boston is uh, um, is 15 minutes service. Um, so let's also say commuter rail locked. Um, Boston is definitively every 15 minutes. And I'm just writing these options because all of them have to be modeled. Now it's possible to do some kind of exclusions, like maybe say that New York, the, the, if something, is, so, so instead of having, you know, this kind of Alpha Centauri style units where you're going to have, where you can have, where you, where you for, in Alpha Centauri you choose weapons, armors, uh, weapons, armor, chassis, and uh, uh, chassis reactor, which is a fancy way of saying hit points, and um, a bunch of uh, uh, extras each separately. So there are like thousands or tens of thousands of units, uh, of distinct units. And it's on you to figure out which, based on the formula that converts each of these things to a cost, is the best. Um, but um, to to reduce the search tree somewhat, it's possible to say things like Boston's definitely every 15 minutes. Okay, this is how we've planned the PM thing. Um, it's not going to be every 10. If it's not going to be every 15, it's going to be every 30. Uh, oh, um, Borner is asking why not more than 16 cars. Um, the, it, it's again older infrastructure. Um, the old um, so the stations in the northeast, um, for the most part, the bigger ones allow sixteen or can be very difficultly extended to sixteen, but not beyond. So I think Philadelphia, I think it's fourteen. New York is sixteen, seventeen. Um, I think DC, the high platforms are something like sixteen, seventeen, maybe eighteen at most. Um, Boston is short. Boston is extendable, but Boston, the, um, let, me, let me actually check how long Boston is. Um, New Haven is eight, but extendable. But when, once you start doing a lot more than 16, it's actually hard to expand. And the hardest station of all to rebuild, Penn Station, is 16. So South Station, let's see. Um, it's difficult because parts of it are under the bus terminal. So, uh, and I don't fully trust everything, like, um, so you see that there's a track here and the track ends here, here are the track ends, I think this is where the bumper is, so maybe here, I can't, I can't tell. No, 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 the bumper is actually here. Like, Google is slightly wrong, I think, about where it is. So, this track is 325 meters. So, this is 13 cars. Yeah, I mean, there are. Ugh, I'm sorry. Oh, right, because the platforms in Berlin are going to be 55, yeah. Um. Yeah, so. I would not even look at double deckers. Again, double deckers exist en masse in exactly one place, which is France, and this is inherently incompatible with um, inherently incompatible with the high platforms of the Northeast. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So the issue is that here you can't assume full new infra fully new infrastructure. Even to get to four hundred, you need to retrofit certain things, which again is worth it. Um, it's absolutely worth it to figure out how to, I mean, this needs to slightly get rebuilt anyway, how to go up until about here, and then you still need 
a little bit more and then ext extend it a little bit here. I mean, you can get to 400 in Boston. It's just a little bit painful, and I think 440 is very painful. Um, and New Haven is kind of in the same boat. Um, so train length, okay, so let me just say, um, train length is definitively 16 cars, 400 meters. Almost certainly trains are integrally 16 car, not um, double eight car train sets. And this is something that is specific to the sizes of the American cities. Um, there's, I don't think there's any situation in which you would need to decouple. Um, because um, we're working in the, under the assumption that trains run every 10 or 15 minutes. Now, if these trains run hourly, okay, so let's say that New York were not a metropolis of 23 million people, counting very far away cities in the same orbit like New Haven and Toronto, if you don't count them as 18. Um, so let's say that New York were not a metropolis that is literally the third largest city in the developed world after Tokyo and Seoul. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Um, wait, why? I thought that the Chinese high-speed trains were five abreast and not four abreast. Or do they have restaurant cars? Um, I'm tacitly assuming no restaurant cars and four abreast, so 1100, so Shinkansen density. Like, if you take the Shinkansen and, uh, oh, yes, yeah, so if you take the Shinkansen and, and surgically replace every row of five seats with a row of four seats, you get 1,098 seats. Um, I'm assuming about, I'm assuming 1,100, but really I need to assume 1,000. Um, capacity, uh, I'm not even going to talk about this because it's mostly about timetabling, and remember, you always make the worst assumptions. So 1,000 is pretty much a worst-case assumption. I'm pretty sure you can make a Velaro. If it's like an integrally 16-car Velaro with cafe cars, it would be about 1,000, I think. Um, um, so almost certainly, so this does not... So this is for things that are not going to be made possible. Um, so let's say train sets. Okay. Um, Timetables should be written for mildly, for active suspension, mild tilt trains, which is 180 millimeter cant efficiency, um, but also standard trains, 130 millimeters at high speed, 150 millimeter at low speed. Um, and this is important because um, the now the dif the difference between these is not huge, but it's there. Um, and the reason for this is that even though these trains are better, and technically these trains are also cheaper because these trains because active suspension is Japanese, and Japanese trains are cheaper than Euro trains. Japanese trains are cheaper than Euro Japanese trains in Japan are cheaper than European trains in Europe. I don't think Japanese trains in America are cheaper than European trains in America. Um, of note, I don't think the A train, so Japanese train in Europe is cheaper than European trains. I mean, I shouldn't call the A train a Japanese train. It's a European train made by a Japanese company in the same way that the Ford Focus is a European car made in a, made at, I believe, a British factory by a company that, yes, is owned by an American one, but, but it's that, yes, is owned in the United States, is controlled in the United States, but the car is designed exclusively for the European market. Um, I think maybe even the engineering might be done in Europe in the same way that the engineering for the um, Honda Accords that are sold in the United States. Um, Honda has an, not just American plants, but also American engineering offices, which is where they're planning the cars, where, where, where they're designing the cars made for the American uh, market. Um, so the Honda Accord, I mean, yes, there's a Honda Accord sold in Japan. It has the same name as a Honda Accord sold in the United States. It is not the same car, I don't think. Um, the, the Honda Accord is uh, the American Honda Accords are fully American cars. They're just not made, made in Detroit, and the profits go to a Japanese company. So, in the same way, um, I don't think actually the, the Japanese trains get cheaper once um, you leave Japan because Japan hates 
exporting just the cheap parts of its stack. It really wants to upsell you on its consulting services, which will tell you how to build a train between not quite Houston and not quite Dallas um, on a viaduct, not um, on earthworks. Um, and uh, and then you're going to be captive to Japanese stack. They, they do this to a bunch of other places. They, they do it to India with poor results on the Indian high-speed rail projects. Uh, on the high-speed rail project, the only high-speed rail in the world that has lower capacity on the high-speed trains than the slow trains. Like, we're talking about making the trains bigger if we're already building high-speed rail. In India, the rakes on the commuter trains um, in, in the cities are 3 meters 66 centimeters, so they're not 5 abreast, they're 6 abreast. However, the plan for the high-speed trains between Mumbai and Gujarat is... Um, for the trains to be Shinkansen size, so only 3 meters um, 35, not 3 meters 66, so 5 abreast, not 6 abreast. Again, only part in the world that, that does that. Um, and they're also going to be standard and not broad gauge, um, which is a, which does have a precedent. Um, Spain is a broad gauge country that uses standard gauge high-speed trains. The difference is that Spain is doing it for um, compatibility with France, whereas India has no interest whatsoever or need for compatibility with it's only standard gauge neighbor, which is um, the People's Republic of China. Um, so um, now let, let me get off my rant about how poorly planned the Indian high-speed rail project is and why um, India needs to stop hating itself. I mean, maybe it should hate itself when it's designing things like caste systems or uh, um, university uh, dorms. Uh, apparently, uh, there's, there are curfews on women, but not men, as a kind of um, safety precaution at at least one university. Um, and yes, women did complain. But um, so maybe that is where India should try to ado adopt other cultures, not in not not in terms of like its own hating its own engineers and planners and hating its own rail gauge. Um, there's nothing inherently modern about standard gauge. Um, so at any rate. On hindsight, I don't know. I mean, I can see a world in which in which France to Spain high speed rail actually works well. Okay, um, this is um, a world in which the gap, which is entirely on the French side because across the border it's been built already, so the gap is being built. Like, like they're building high speed rail across the gap. So they've built, so they built up to Nîmes um, when they built to Marseille. That would have been more than 20 years ago. I'm pretty sure they've just built all the way to Montpellier, um, but in a kind of weird way that makes it impossible to serve both Montpellier and points south. I'm mean, like, pretty sure like the, the bypass leaves before, not after, or something, or some weird shit. Um, and they're, they're planning on closing the gap going all the way to Perpignan. Um, the problem is the trains... I mean, I'm not going to say the trains are going to be fast. Like, the average speed is going to be high. It is France, and it is Spain. It is not Germany. Um, but, so up to, I'm forgetting the exact trip times, I can check, but it's going to be surprisingly less useful than anything. It's something like, I think, four hours to the border, and then border to Barcelona. Like, it's going to end up being something like a seven-hour Paris to Madrid trip. Like, the faster way to go to Madrid is not to go this way, but to go this way. Um, this is also really good for capacity balancing because that would put more trains um, on the Elgevet-Sud-Europe-Atlantique, uh, Sud which is under full, and fewer trains on the elgevet sud -Est, which is pretty full. Um, and this part is already is like about to open anyway, so it's a little bit more work, but I think that this would be valuable. And it's something that I can absolutely see actually happen. I don't mean happen in like, um, um, uh, and I don't mean happen in the same way that I talk about things happening in the, same, in, in the way of having a European army and a Euro federal government in which the EU parliament actually can introduce its own bills without having the commission um, hold its hands and uh, in which the Euro, Euro federalism goes all the way up until um, the current borders of Belarus with Russia and the internationally recognized border of Ukraine with Russia, this border, not whatever Russia has occupied as of 
thirteenth of November, uh, the thirteenth of the thirteenth of September, which is likely not necessarily be occupied by Russia in a week, but we will see. So I don't mean that kind of thing. I mean something that I can see almost happen on like current institutions. Um, I can even vaguely see SNCF and Renfe eventually come up with an agreement that gets the frequencies and the fares to at least semi-reasonable levels. I mean, SNCF has done it with DB. And SNCF is, I think, a lot more worried about competition from DB than from Renfe. So all of this is viable. Um, it's just being very slow because European governance is very slow. Um, anything international, not even just EU-wide, just international happens very slowly. Um, but it's something that I think is viable. So, so I, I would not slag on the Spanish decision to build standard gauge. I would slag on the Indian decision. Thankfully, it's not a big, it's not a deal in the United States. We're not going to have to do different plans. Oh, are you going to build BART gauge or are you going to build standard gauge? No. Standard gauge. India is not, is not about to invade and occupy the United States. And if it did, it would probably convert BART to standard gauge and not convert the rest of America to Indian gauge because India is about five minutes from banning its own rail gauge. Um, yeah, you know, I know, I know, SNCF, I know SNCF is terrible, but SNCF, I don't think SNCF terribleness is a con, is a constant in nature. Like, again, SNCF is actually cooperating pretty well with Deutsche Bahn on the edge of Est. Um, at any rate, so again, we're not talking about the gauge anymore because there's only one gauge in America, thankfully, unless you count BART, which you shouldn't. We need to discuss, we need to figure out tilt versus no tilt, which essentially just means running the same code on two different kinds of train sets. Um, this means running the performance code on um, Shinkansen N700, but also on um, but um, this is the export version, which is a little higher powered. Um, but also the weaker, but um, more standard Velour Nova. Now, when you say more standard, more there are more N7. I'm pretty sure there are more N700s in circulation than Velaro, certainly Velour Novos, which are only now rolling off. Um, but again, as exports, you're tethered to one vendor, which is Japan. Um, the, so high-speed train sets in Japan work as in France in the way that their own in, in the, the designs are owned centrally, um, or rather, in the, the T TGVs are a joint project of Alstom and uh, SNCF. So, and, and, and likewise, the Shinkansen are um, only, there used to be the designs used to be owned by J and R, and I don't know who owns them now. I don't know if it's JRE and JR Central or the Shinkansen. Settlement Corporation, but um, it's not like if you do, so even though the same train is going to be manufactured by many different, like it's going, but it's going to be manufactured by license by Kawasaki and Hitachi and Sumimoto and Kinki Shario and Nippon Shario, um, you're not going to be able, they're not going to compete with each other for, they don't compete with each other for export markets in high-speed rail. They do compete with each other, by the way, for um, other trains. So um, if you want to buy um a commuter train, or if you want to buy a subway train, then yeah, you might have comp then you might have competing competing bids from multiple Japanese companies, but not in high speed rail. So it's kind of anti competitive to work only around, around to, row, to work around the train performance that exists only in Japan and and with Velaro, not Velaro, with the Talgo trains. The Talgo trains, I mean, that's still two vendors, but the Talgos are inherently um, first of all, the Talgo design is inherently low platform. Um, and it would require a lot of modifications to make it high platform. And second, the Talgo, 20% of the train's length is locomotive. Um, no, uh, um, no inherently low floor trains like TGVs or Talgo should be considered for the plan. So, See how the timer just slipped. Um, it's not going to be in that one. It's going to be in this. Um, H of star. Case. 
preliminary. I'm going to reserve this. What? What? Um. Oh, N hundred. Oh, it's it's called N seven hundred. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Um. Is the N700S also all um, wheels powered, or is it like the N700 and that the end cars are unpowered? Um, anyway, so this is the train set. Um, capacity, this also affects, I'm going to talk about how this affects timetabling because um, uh, as it, um, for TPH is every 15 minutes, 6 is every 10, so stopping patterns would need to be fidgeted. Out six trains to running every 15 minutes on Boston Providence. Now, Boston is definitively every 15 minutes, as I said, New York, can be every 15 or every 10, most likely every 10. Um, Philadelphia, not sure yet, Washington. So Washington is a little bit weird. And by a little bit weird, what I mean is the quality of the computer trains in Washington is horrific. So let's check the pen line. Now, I, um, mark train schedules. This might also be a corona timetable, so it might not. Oh, okay, N700S is like N700, okay. Okay. Um, mark pen line. I love how they say Penn Washington as opposed to Baltimore Penn Station Washington because everyone must know what Penn and Camden are. Departing from, no, I'm not gonna depart, no, I'm gonna depart from no, it was, oh, you're not seeing this. Departing from, they don't say Baltimore Penn, they say Penn Station. <sighs> Arriving at, Moscow is not working, Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, direction of your trip. I love how they say outbound when it's very clearly inbound because the in and is watching. Let's do it in a week. Just because right now it's afternoon and I kind of want to see the morning timetable. Get schedule. What is their problem? Also, why is this website um, terrible? Let's face it. Penn Station. Why are you not? Oh, because schedule and timetable are two different things in America. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So. From the Penn Station. Trains depart. In the morning, I usually do, do rush hour arrival, so 666 888 So every 20 minutes-ish. I mean, not quite, because it's never an, an uneven talk because America, and then off-peak, I am impressed that they're, they run almost hourly service off-peak. Um, all of this is, of course, with diesels, even though the line is entirely under catenary. They de-electrified um, the commuter trains between Baltimore and Washington years ago because um, of hostility between Mark and Amtrak, in which I believe Amtrak was at fault. Um, Was so Washington, you can't base this on an existing talk because the trains objectively suck. Um, so I'm going to say can be every 15 or every 10 if every 20 um, it's a subset of every ten with every other train missing. This is really important. Um, what I mean by this is that um, 
if you're trying to make a train that runs every 20 minutes and a train that runs and a train that runs every 10 minutes share tracks, which you do need to because Baltimore to Washington is, I believe, almost entirely four track. But um, I think there are some three track narrows there that need to be timetabled around. Um, what matters is the busier of the two lines. Uh, doesn't matter if it's the faster or the slow, but it has to be the busier. Um, so sharing 10, 10 and sharing 20, 10 and sharing 30, 10 and sharing an hour of 10 um, are equally difficult. Unless, I mean, if it's something extreme, like a train every hour and a train every 10 minutes, then you can fidget with it by um, essentially fucking up your talk. Um, so the idea is that, like, let's say it's a fast train every hour and a slow train every 10 minutes, then the then every different slow train is going to be overtaken somewhere along its route by a fast train. So it might be held up at different spots. Um, but that's extremely off stock. And that should uh, probably not be done. Um, yeah, there are eight car trains uh, running exclusively on JR West territory. Um, those, I believe, are also only four abreast, not five abreast. Um, trains, I don't think any train runs between Tokyo and Kagoshima. Um, I believe the trains run Tokyo to um, Hakata or um, Shinosaka to um, Kagoshima. Um, so yes, there do exist eight car trains. Um, they are not allowed to use the Tokaido Shinkansen where every train must have exactly 1,323 seats of which 200 are green car. Um, otherwise, JR East's um, scheduling department collapses um, and you might sound like I am slagging on JR, not JR, JR Central, like I'm slagging on JR Central and like I'm slagging on its um, eternal dictator, Kasai. Um, I somewhat am, but this is legitimately an extremely busy at capacity line, so I get why they're, why they're that anal about it. Um, so, Philadelphia is three question mark, probably plan every ten. Um, um, for track sharing. The issue with track sharing, so here's the difference between Philly and Washington. Philly has a lot of commuter lines, Washington doesn't. Washington has two commuter lines that don't ever interact with um, intercity trains, Cam that is to say Camden and uh, Brunswick, and there's the Virginia sidelines which also don't interact because um, they don't run through, um, and if they did run through it would just be um, about opposing uh, traffic about crossing opposing traffic at grade and um, the pen line and so so it's just the pen line whereas in Philadelphia it's actually a complex system with a bunch of throw running that needs to be thought out and this means that I'm gonna make a note to myself talk to fifth square slash Chris Tuff. Healer, and um, I need to actually check that I did not misspell his name. Yes. Okay, good. Um, you see, sometimes my spelling is not terrible. But only sometimes. Um, okay, so this is something I need to talk to because... Um, in Boston, I can make an I can make a very easy assumption on timetabling. They can also make in New York, which is if I did not write the timetable, it is bad. Um, it is tragic. It is fucking tragic that the MBTA, when we yell at them about how to do um, a clock face timetable, think that um, the Fairmount line can only run a train every forty five minutes, not every half hour, um, let alone the every twenty minutes that they need to run, even with diesel. Um, but that's the quality of their timetabling. Um, New York, if the, let, let me just say that if um, the MBTA does a deal in which they lay off their timetable, like the, the scheduling people for commuter rail, and place them at work in New York, displacing the, the, the Metro North and the LIR people, and then the MBTA hires the Transit Matters Regional Rail team instead, it's going to improve planning quality substantially in both Boston and New York. Um, again, in New York, um, it's, in New York, the basic issue is the baboon role, and it's not because it's not that I'm criticizing them for being baboons. I'm criticizing them for thinking that they can't cooperate with any other railroad, even when they and the other railroad are, are both living off of 
funding by the same state or by federal or, or federal funding. Um, like like the extent of this is like saying um, it's like you're in an absolute monarchy, and you tell a bunch of different um, people with some power, like different lords or something or whatever, or different courtiers, the king. Um, our, our, our eternal sun king or something has this plan to make the kingdom even greater by doing the whatever. And um, each lord says, well, I'm very happy to help, but the lord next door would not want to do it. Now, you would probably understand that as a very stupid excuse because in an absolute monarchy, the king can just do it and the other lord next door has to obey the same king. Now, the United States is not an absolutist state, and I don't mean it in the sense of not, not just it's not an absolute monarchy, but also in the sense that it has a lot. It, it has it is highly decentralized. Israel is an absolutist state, okay. And in Israel, the only reason Ranana gets to have opinions about the metro is that the state permits it to, which boils down to the fact that a Knesset law that would tell Ranana, we do not care about your opinions about the metro law, about the metro. Uh, the, the metro law is the one that muzzled Ranana. Um, it w very clearly had majority support and did not pass because of some bullshit machinations in which everyone figured it was a good law to pass that would be highly supported by nearly all parties and by the general public, so we could held as a hostage for other things. Essentially, this is why there's no metro law in Israel, but Israel, again, is this kind of highly absolutist state. Um, Again, the absolute ruler in Israel is the collective government, which is highly democratic. Modulo, I won't say modulo an issue with the former prime minister needing to go to prison, but he might. And Israel is not the only country with a former leader who uh, should um, be seeing the inside of a prison cell. Hi, Italy. Hi, America. Um, to be very clear, when I say hi, America, I don't just mean Donald Trump. Um and, um, but even with that level of decentralization, oh, um, by, by, by Tomas, um, so, um, even with that level of decentralization, the federal government funds this so much, and there's actually so much federal involvement in coordinating and planning when it comes to high-speed rail, when it comes to intercity rail, it's like, Considered a priority. High speed rail is spectacular. Everyone understands this. Everyone understood this in the Obama stimulus era um, to the point that a rational planner at Metro North, which is not something that exists, sadly, but a rational planner at Metro North who sees some kind of intransigence by New Jersey Transit or the LIR or Amtrak um, can go to the federal government um, through, for example, their um, Congressional representation, for example, Senator Murphy, who, by all accounts, seems to be, by all accounts, seems to be. I, I'm not going to say amazing on this issue, not because, and it's not as I, and it's on me damning him by faint phrase, it's because um, he's, again, yeah, it seems like a very solid senator to me, but um, I'm not going to say he's amazing in the same way that um, I can say, oh, this politician has already or is almost passing this specific law as their personal thing, okay? Like, I, I can say that someone like Senator Tammy Duckworth is amazing on issues of accessibility because I have seen what she has done. With someone like Senator Murphy, I mean, I know that he's very interested in this. Um, he seems pretty good, as far as I can tell. Um, his, like, general political agenda seems good. If, if I were an American citizen, if I lived in New Haven, I would be happy to, to vote for him. I would... Like, I can't see myself vote for a primary challenger, a general election challenger, but um, um, so, so they can go, so, so this Metro North planner can go to Senator Murphy, or if it's New York, to Governor Hochul, who wants to be seen as doing things for New York for infrastructure, um, or to Senator Schumer, Senator um, Gillibrand, and ask um, for help. Or even go to the FRA, go to the FRA, go to go to USDOT, go to any of these coordinating bodies, um, NEC Connect, and say and, and say, ooh, we're having this kind of friction. We're trying to figure out the timetable. Can we figure out a coordinated timetable? But they don't do that. 
And the reason they don't do that is first the baboon rule, they, each of them thinks the others are baboons, but more importantly, they don't know how to do coordinated timetables. And in Philadelphia is, is, is what I'm bringing in, mix, uh, and I'm setting, on, setting myself up to contrast Boston, New York with Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, they fucking hired Christoph Spieler to write their timetables, okay? I mean, not literally because it's a, it's a long process that's taking far too long, but in Philadelphia, um, the timetables are being written by a competent person who knows how um, who um, who knows how to do coordinated planning. So um, anyway, this is why this is something that I need to talk to other people about, which does make this not purely me, but does make it easier because it means that someone else has already done much of the hard work. Whereas so here, I've done the hard work already mostly here. This is the hard part um, for a commuter at Target. Washington is easy because it is mostly four tracks. Um, again, there are some three track narrows, um, but I believe the line is at this point mostly four track. Um, I'm actually gonna check this because I know it used to be triple track and they, and for the same reason they didn't do um, coordinated planning, Boston Providence, they also didn't do it in Baltimore, Washington, but the upshot is that they, um, made my life a lot easier. Um, I mean, at the cost of money that they should have spent on better things, but... Okay. Um, eventually, this is going... It's sufficient zoom. Um, this is going to show me how many tracks there are. It is not this level of zoom, sadly. I think maybe I need one more. Okay, so this is triple track. And note that they're having different colors for um, slow and fast train, so that they're essentially saying that this part, um, they consistently, I guess, use the West Winter tracks for Amtrak, which is kind of weird. So this is triple track, triple track, triple track here. So where? So I, I know it's partly for a track, but I, I... Okay, this is something that I'm going to check because I'm starting to disbelieve myself. Um, Northeast Carter. Uh, no, I don't need. The problem is that there's no good way to download this because I'm pretty sure that I can download this with too much information on the side. So this, this. Okay. If this is triple track, then it is more complicated to do track sharing if it's every 10 minutes. Um, and there might need to be four track overtakes. The advantage is that Mark can run pretty fast. It used to run 200 kilometers an hour. I mean, with electric locomotives with a large stop penalty, but that's not hard to fix. Um, especially now that they would need new train sets anyway because they de-electrified. The wires are still there, bear in mind. So um, they didn't literally rip off, rip, rip, not rip off, rip out. The wire. I mean, they also ripped off the residents, they ripped off the taxpayers, they, they ripped off the riders, but that's all I mean by the rip. But they did not, um, they, they, they did not rip out the tracks. Prepositions, I don't um, Okay, this is telling me this line is entirely three track, which is definitely not what I remember. I thought it was like being four track. Um, this is the airport, yeah. Huh. This is interesting. Um, let me check what Wikipedia has to say about this because this is really strange. Timeline. They're going to tell me he, uh, on the side where it's three or four. Oh, they're not saying. Oh, so that's a long-term plan, but it has to happen. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so this means that, um, okay, if, if they haven't actually done this, then they probably shouldn't, should only four-track bits of it, um, and then do timed overtakes. Um, but, um, so, th so that's something that does need to be planned a little better. Um, 
So there's that. Um, what else? Um, there is, um, so, so these are the main sharing points. Again, the pain point, the pain points are New York and Philadelphia, but Philadelphia is not a big pain point and most of this will have been figured out already. Um, so these are the capacity issues. Um, okay. Um, and remember, all of these need to be modeled and this is gonna be a bunch of different things. Remember, like, for example, every single such option needs to be modeled with two possibilities of high-speed train sets so that the report can say, this works better with this, this works better with that. Um, so there's capacity commuter rail tact. Um, these are the, okay. Um, what else is there? Um, um, station infrastructure. Um, um, New York may be redone dramatically, so there might be a big, um, probably bundled with separate HSR only tunnels into Penn Station, but may be worth figuring out separately. So what do I mean by figuring out separately? So i.e. business as usual, so Penn as usual, um, rebuilt Penn with shared commuter rail HSR track. That's the, in one, my, one of my older videos about Penn Station would be called the three line system um, or rebuilt Penn with dedicated track. And that would be in, in, that's in the same video called the four line system. Or, um, um, so, I mean, I mean, if you're, you're not going to do rebuild pen with a dedicated track and then pen as usual, because what the hell is the point? Like, this is hard. Like, this is harder than getting to here. Um, okay. Um, under the shared assumption. Um, how far does Gateway go? Just N or Grand Central Alt G? Um, which line into N gets high speed rail? Almost certainly the old tunnel, so that you don't need to have high speed trains hog. I would say hog the high, um, Grand Central. It's not a hog. These are these, these are bigger trains. But then Harlem on Twenty Fifth Street is a uh, constraint. Um, these are the main questions in Manhattan. Um. More questions, shared or otherwise. Um, how much? Um, how does New York look outside uh, Penn Station? I think that's the question. Um, how does New York look outside Manhattan? So here are some options. Um, Sunny side junction it doesn't get a station, but maybe it should. Um, track sharing on Hellgate with um, station access under the shared. Something. Remember, if there, if you do dedicated tracks for high-speed trains, they're not gonna use the Helga. I mean, if you're built, if you're doing dedicated tracks on like under the river, then you're not going to then make train share track with the Hellgate. So these are separate options. So, so in this case, it's easier to plan dedicated. It's always easier to plan dedicated tracks and share tracks. Just if you plan dedicated tracks, you're planning a more expensive system. That's all. Um, so under the shared assumption, there are a lot more things to worry about. Is something to notice. Um, essentially, 
a lot more effort spent on organization as opposed to concrete. Um, now, this is just my time, which is by the standards of infrastructure costs free. Um, now, it turns out that it might turn out that this is a bad this is a bad idea. It might turn out that it's actually good to do full um, to do a fully dedicated track. Let me shrink myself a little bit, and I'm going to shrink myself so that when I use this. Um, you can see the, yeah, um, you can see this, the left side of this, okay. Um, okay, um, New York, Trenton timetable, um, Um, let me say uh, New York, New Haven timetable is also important. Uh, LIRR is not. LIRR, I don't think, might ever share track again with Amtrak um, under, I think, any reasonable gateway um, plan. So that uh, makes everything a lot easier. I mean, I guess, actually, no, um, Port Washington branch. Uh, Mike, but... Uh, Uh, but the rest of the LIRR would not. Um, what else? Um, and then them with Morris and Essex lines, perhaps. Um, and we're saying New York to Brampton, both of these include branches. So to New Haven means also figuring out the issue with what? The issue with, uh, Dan, uh, New Canaan, Danbury, Waterbury. Um, this mean, also means uh, figuring out the issues with um, the North Jersey coastline, which are not actually that difficult given the, the extent of separation on the existing Northeast corridor. Um, and again, it's again it's mostly a New York project because New York is where it's hardest. In Boston, it's largely already figured out. Um, Maybe I should not call it station infrastructure and I should move this. Uh, commuter rail tact, okay. Um, commuter rail track sharing might be better. And then what about Boston? Um, so Boston should be planned with MSRL, but also without. Figure out if it's at all useful to connect HSR with NSRL or instead make NSRL regional rail only with intercity connections Portland handled as long range regional rail on the model of Berlin Rostock or Berlin Magdeburg. Um, maybe Berlin Rostock is not the best example, but Berlin Magdeburg is because it runs on the Stadtbahn and they're slowly trying to move high speed trains away from the Stadtbahn. Um, and if you ask me, they should move all high speed trains away from the Stadtbahn and just use the much faster north south mainline. Um, and then turn over the Stadtbahn into re um, to turn the Stadtbahn over to regional trains that go to Potsdam and beyond or to, um, Schwandau and beyond, and um, kind of make this an express sort of S-Bahn within the city, so as opposed to a line that runs a bunch of hourly trains, which is fine if the trains are hourly, just that they don't overlay to be um, to, to be regularly every 10 minutes. Um, as a kind of a Stadtbahn, express bypass, and they should just run maybe a bit more service, but also make sure that the gaps are, are shorter um, on, on the trunk. Okay, um, I don't know how much planning needs to be done in Philadelphia at all. Um, Philadelphia is a question of the triple track um, section from the city to Wilmington. Is it designed with 
overtakes? And the answer is probably not. Um, probably not. There are a lot of stations. Is it to be or tracked? Is it to be by past, e.g., via the airport line and the freight branch that can be elevated? You guys don't know what I mean when I say a freight branch that can be elevated. Um, I think the pen design plan does that. Um, and I used to be a big fan of that, and I'm not sure whether it's a good idea. So this is the current line. It's this one, and it is only three track. It traces not four tracks. So this is four track, I guess. But I guess that um, but parts of it are three track. Um, and I, so it's possible that, uh, that I'm blowing smoke in that in, in that dock, and it's perfectly valid triple track. It's been perfectly valid to leave as is because I guess maybe enough of it, maybe more of it is four track than I um, realized or something. Like maybe up, uh, maybe about here it drops. No, that's still four track. Am I just bullshitting? If the entirety of this thing is four track, then I've just made my life a lot easier because I'm pretty sure I don't need to ever interact with except for regional rail. Um, and at this point, this is right next to the freeway where you can always, you can just... Sorry, oh, is it three, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it, okay, so first of all here, if you somehow need an extra track, there's room. Um, huh, okay. Okay, so that's not actually a, okay, uh, okay, so it's not the triple track section. City to Wilmington. Is it to be bypassed? So anyway, that's so. At any rate, that is okay. So this is easier than I thought. Um, but there's still the bypass option, which needs to be studied. Although I'm pretty sure the likely answer is no, don't do it. Which is to instead of doing this, to do this, which is vaguely near the airport. If you really want, you can even loop via the airport um, and stop at terminals. And then this is a so the. So commuter trains do this. Um, it's possible to like maybe build a tunnel that loops like this and then do this, and then um, or or not do the loop and just make people and just make this an air train or make this an air train or something. And then this is a freight line. It's a freight line. You can see the um, you can see the um, branches coming out of the, the, the sidings. It's also um, an at grade line. So you would need to first of all you need to not just not not share this with the freight, but also this would need to be elevated, which is not that hard. This is, there's lots of space for elevation here, um, and you need to slightly move the alignment because the curves are designed for freight, but the right of way is not actually that problematic. Um, the main reason I looked at this is I'm pretty sure that this is like this, but like these curves are a little bit annoying, like this specific. Um, quadruplet of curves. One, two. Wait, this is a curve. Am I drunk? This is a curve. This is a curve. Is yes. So it's three curves, not two curves. No, not four curves. Um, on the other hand, we can just check the radius right now using the circle tool. Um. Okay, I don't even think it's a thousand. I think it's more. What if it, what if we try to fit this circle on the track? Um, so here we are between the two outermost tracks, and immediately the the curve of the circle is already tighter than the curve of the tracks. So. What if we do what if we do fifteen hundred? Put this in perspective. I'm pretty sure if this is twelve hundred, if this is twelve hundred, then okay. And let me to make sure. Okay, so twelve. So fifteen oh seven. 
even then, it's, I mean, you need to make sure because this is not perfectly aligned, but now this is better aligned with the middle of the curve. This is 15 of seven. Um, okay, it might actually be following this curve pretty well. So this might actually be about the correct radius of this curve. 1507, um, if you assume the higher, uh, if, if you assume the active suspension trains, the um, higher pant deficiency, then it's 220 kilometers per hour territory. If you do not, if you only assume 130, um, then it is, um, what is it, uh, 130 plus 200 ish? 330, right? Am I missing something? Yeah, it's 2.1. Then it's 200 kilometers an hour. I mean, let me just check that uh, that maybe the other curves are not now are, are not tighter than this. But I mean. Within Philadelphia, I don't think you're going more than 200 anyway because of noise. Yeah, this maybe follows the circle. Like it's not. Yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah. So it's not actually a bad curve to that needs to be bypassed or anything. Okay. That is helpful to me. Um, okay, that is helpful to know. Um, and um, so there was a question of do airport service or not? Again, I expect the answer to be no, but who knows? Um, is Wilmington to be bypassed by all only express or no train? So when I say Wilmington bypass, here's what I mean. Um, the train, the well, this line, what I thought was a bad curve, is actually not a bad curve that close to the city. Wilmington, you see how it's like this, these curves? I mean, so either every train that hits Wilmington stops at Wilmington, or if you need to have trains skipping Wilmington, you need to use this freight line, so this, or something like the freight right of way. You might need to zap parts of the industrial line in Edgemore and go like this around Wilmington. And that presumably would just be for express trains and then locals will still call it Wilmington, but you might want to be cruel and see what if all of them do that, that's... Um, um, and can be dropped as an assumption. as a possibility which means Two things to model here, not three. Um, Wilmington to uh, Wilmington Perryville alignment is somewhat greenfield, but not not, not, not a big deal. Um, Philly to Trenton is easy because the line is the line, and there's no commuter attraction because it's all for track. And the commuter trains, if they want to be, I mean, if they need to run express, and I don't think they do, they can just do it on high speed rail terms. Um, here again, I, I, I did this on video, it's a little more complex and very little, I mean, it's actually a pain point. This is a pain point. Um, what are the other pain points? Um, how is New Rochelle to Stanford handled I-95 bypass with At Rye and Rye at Port Chester and Port 
for something else. Um, Stanford to New Haven is Stanford New Haven presumably um, keeps HSR on express tracks, commuter rail on local tracks because there's no real reason to run any commuter trains express past Stanford despite the fact that it currently exists due to poor timetabling. Okay, so the track sharing, okay, New Haven to New London, that's not a thing because it's going to be on I-95 bypass. I don't think there are multiple options for that. You just look at this. Um, okay, let me actually do something different. Big alignment questions. Um, the trains go via New London and Providence or via Hartford and Providence or least likely by Hartford and Worcester. Um, so the Hartford Worcester option is, I think, the one that plant design called for, which is this one, which has a problem, which is that, um, first of all, you're not serving Worcester, you're serving Jane Worcester. Um, but that's also on the Boston to Albany section. In general, it's a Boston to Albany problem, which is that Boston to Providence is very easy if you just add a bypass for four cracks, for four, no, four cracks, for four trains per hour. Boston to Worcester has a giant pain point here, which both has a lot of different state, like, like three different commuter rail stations. Um, and um, there's no way of four tracking this. And um, trying to fit them together, um, yes, you can like try to bypass elsewhere. That's fine. Um, this is getting triple tracked already, but um, and and, and then the high speed trains would depart here. But like adding things here to make this the bypass is really awkward. So this is actually a pretty big thing. Um, can still be modeled maybe just to see what it's like, but it is a pain point and it's going, it's spending a lot of money on providing worse service. Um, whereas Hartford to Providence, this is entirely Greenfield and people will complain, but people always complain. And this means that it is, I think, substantially easier. Like if you go to Hartford, just turn east here. Um, and there is a pain point, which is that there's no route that goes easily into Providence. So, okay, you do a little tunnel. This is not going to be a long tunnel. It's going to be probably you start tunneling around here. Um, maybe if you like, like, maybe you do something like this if you want to avoid going underwater. Um, and then once you emerge around here, you can just go above ground and you might need to do some suburban demolitions and the excerpts of Johnston and North situate, but it's like 10, 20, 30. Like, I doubt it's going to be 10 houses in the entire state of um, Rhode Island and Providence Plantation. No chance for a manufacturer. And there's a chance, but I think it's wrong. Um, actually, this is a... This might actually... I'm not, I'm not going to put it in big line questions about commuter rail track sharing. The whole point of NSRL is, is there track sharing with commuter rail? I mean, there's commuter rail. Is there track sharing with intercity rail? Um, so this is a big, this is probably the biggest alignment question. Um, what other alignment questions do we have? Um, let's move here to trains. Divert a bit from the NEC to serve PHL and uh, is there a bypass around Wilmington? And I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just decree that all local trains are gonna stop here for express trains. I think these are the big alignment questions, right? Um, can think of other really contentious things um, about what to serve because just because the Northeast corridor 
has so many sections that are already good that it kind of constrains you because you're not going to randomly build around them when about half the line is already built to high or more than half the line is already built to high speed rail standards, which is really good because it means you're going to spend money. Um, on, on, on upgrading Boston to Providence, for example, it's already there. You just need to build one, maybe two extra four track segments, um, which are very short. Um, Commuter track sharing. Um, curve modifications. Um, so this is not all the curves that have to be modified. It's all the curves where it's a question of what to do. Um, so, okay, Canton Viaduct I'm declaring is not on the list. Um, so because it's not a, because it's a question of what to do and not a question of individual curves, usually the, the issue is that if there are two curves that are in pro close proximity, you do both or none. Like the stuff around Pawtucket, I mean, if you fix this curve, but not this curve or this curve, that's, I mean, you're spending money for nothing. So you probably are fixing multiple curves at once is the point. Um, this is, by the way, 225 kilometer an hour territory. I don't think that should be on the list for being fixed. Um, so, what we'll bucket? Yes or no? Okay. Um, East Greenwich. Um, East Greenwich is um, on. It, it, so, East Greenwich is this. Um, it, it, it's a section because it kind of interrupts very fast running and so it might be valuable to fix even though it's objectively already fixed. Like, it's very fast, so it's not the fastest. Um, not going to deal with I-95 because it's not a curve modification, it's going to be a line. Um, New Haven this is vaguely a curve modification. It might actually be a it's a big line of questions, it's a small line of question of what you do, of whether you go here or here, you do, you just go here. Um, West Haven is fine, the question is where you draw on Milford. So, Milford is, again, question marks are things that may or may not happen. Um, Bridgeport has to be a tunnel, so the question is Bridgeport alignment. And I'm going to say tunnel alignment because you can't avoid a tunnel, not when this is how steep, the, how sharp the curve is on the existing line. And this, um, I don't think Fairfield is a question. Fairfield, you just bypass. I don't think it's a yes no question. It's just a yes. Um, Green Farms maybe. I can't tell. Um, Green Farms is a little bit annoying. Then you're going to go on I-95 and figure out how to get from there, but it's, you don't need to do separate. If you need to do separate alignments, it's something very local and just pick the best. Um, Darien, uh, Darien Greenfield alignment. As a reminder, Greenfield alignment is it's not even a euphemism because I'm open about what this involves. It just means building, it just means doing a lot of demolitions through Neuroton Heights um, on the theory that Neuroton Heights is not a sovereign state and, it, and not, neither is Darien or Tlarge and if they don't like it they should move. I can recommend places for them to move. Um, thinking Atlanta. Um, Stanford is not really a question, just go here. Okay, this is a weird thing. Um, this is not as big as a small iron question, which I'm sure has a correct answer, which is do this, but I do want to study this. Um, Riverside Legacy NEC um, or turn line. That is a question. That This is not a question. There's only one option. Harrison, yes or no. This is a really weird one because I'm almost certain the answer is no. New Rochelle, how much to fix the S? You can't leave it as is, but there's it's trade offs how much you want to demolish. Um, on the Jersey side, Elizabeth, same question how much to fix the S? 
um, Metro Park Metaction again. How much to fix the S's? Do you spell S's like this or like this? Um, everything else is essentially constrained from big alignment questions. Um, and then so we're skipping to North Maryland, maybe. Um, where the alignment is constrained but not fully. So this is just trying to figure out the optimal alignment. Goes so something like this, some kind of Elkton. Um, either bypassing Elkton if there's going to be a noise problem. Um, so like this, or bypassing more like this because these curves are a little bit annoying. Uh, so I'm just going to call this. It's called Cecil County, I believe. Yeah, this one, yeah. Um, Cecil County bypass. Probably the answer is yes, you bypass, but I'm not certain. There are plans for bridge replacements here. It's mostly just they're good repair crap, like spend a lot of money with nothing to show for it. Um, Um, oh, Baltimore is actually an alignment question. Um, I mean, it's not really because you just do um, station. Um, I don't know where to put this. Baltimore presumably gets the legacy station. Those great circle tunnel bypass, but maybe there's a case for city center station. Um, all of the existing plants, I believe, have a city center station because they spend a lot of money on concrete. This is useful to look at. I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be no, don't do it. Um, like the, you can do tricks like um, kill the highway, like 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 throwing the highway as your alignment. Um, it's I can't, tell how obvious it is. I can't tell how obvious it is, but this is an orphan from a freeway revolt that succeeded. Um, it doesn't connect to a lot, but it does exist as a bypass. Um, so just kill that. Um, and then figure out the downtown location, which is likely going to be really expensive, so maybe not. Um, and then you're, you don't really have choices south of Baltimore, so this is essentially the, let's call them the small alignment question. Yeah, so essentially this set of questions are in theory, like, I mean, saying theory, I mean, East Greenwich, I mean, these things don't really affect each other very much. I mean, you can, like, count how much time is being saved and then try to figure that into various stocked calculations, but these questions can actually be studied for the most part separately. Um, and this is a good thing. I mean, out of uncertainty, Fairfield bypass, yes or no. Um, and yeah, I mean, so yeah, in theory, you can think of it as if you have like two options for each and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, that by itself is 8,192 options but not really because again they're like far enough from each other that each of them has a separate contribution to the timetable um so then you just look and um so then you just look maybe try to figure out a cost if there is one and then um just figure them out as yes or no options and then just say these are some options that can be added and this is what they're going to do like this is not the hard planning part um there are hard planning parts these are mostly Commuter attraction. Like there needs to be something about what's going to be done in New York. So it's kind of suggested the hardest questions are going to be in New York or just outside New York, like a 
up to Newark or something and not in Connecticut. And most of this spending is going to be done in Connecticut because um, New Haven to Kingston is mostly Connecticut, not Rhode Island. And then these curve mods, like, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm saying Bridgeport obviously needs to have a tunnel, but I mean, that's still money. So, uh, and, and um, likewise, I'm kind of implicitly assuming there's going to be a lot of I-95 Greenfield, um, like from here, not this curve, going straight like this, and then only transition back to the main line. Honestly, there might even be, be a case for transitioning here. Um, I used to draw the transition curve around here, but this was before this building was built. And once this is here, turning might actually require too much. Um, like, like too much of a curve. Like, let me check the curve, what curve radius you can get away with here. Like, I mean, if it's a thousand, then you should definitely look into what you can demolish to avoid that. Like, a thousand is, if anything, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's doable. Like, a thousand is definitely doable if you do something like you stay on the. Maybe it's easier to stay on the north side of the freeway. Um, and then from the north side of the freeway. So the south side is easier for noise. Um, there's less residential. Um, north side. The trick is that you stay on the north side, and then this is going to be an annoying aerial. Um, that might be the only way to do it, because a 1,000... Like, the problem is that this is a 100... So a 1,000 is 180 kilometers an hour if you don't... Um, if you do have tilt, and if you don't, it's like 100... 1670. So, like, if you want to stay on the outside of the freeway, like here, it's like almost 1200, but even 1200 is um, not that impressive. 1200, so, like, like, you see the problem? Like, if you go, like, if let's say that I want to not have another S, which might be very very aspirational at this point. Like, if I try to connect to this tangent. So this tangent puts me on the south side of the freeway here. Um, this needs to go, this needs to go. Neither of these looks residential to me. All right, yeah, this is a... Yeah, this is looks like a small... This, this might be a strip mall, which is a lot of things to buy. This might be a price group sometimes, kind of like a little office, like... So this is money, but like I'm pretty sure that this is like single digit million. Like maybe combined, there's gonna be teens, maybe twenty something. Um, what is this? This is is this residential? No. Yeah, this looks industrial in an area where probably industry is not the highest use of land. Um, like if you need to move the freeway, then things get very painful. But um. But like the problem is that if you try to transition from this to this at radius, then you need to kill a lot of things here in the west part, um, which is annoying because it's eminent domain. I mean, if it's like ten houses and you can get away with it, if it's like a hundred, then it starts getting hairy. Um, let, let me actually check what kind of circle you can draw. So the idea is that I'm going to draw a circle that's tangent to this line and roughly tangent here. Um, um, and let's also, and maybe I should look at what, um, things that stay south of the freeway just to reduce the aerial burden because aerials are um, expensive. So yeah, this shaves one, two, this might be too close, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Possibly ten houses, maybe eleven. And this is, and this only got, and, and this would still be the sharpest curve between Greens Farms and Stanford. Um, like Greens Farm, like not even between Greens Farm. Like I mean, Greens Farm. Like, like look at the arc of Greens Farms now. Like this is Greens Farm. Like Greens Farms today can do that. Um, I mean, this is why I think it might need to be stretched, because, like, I mean, Fairfield would be something like, like, like 1.8 thousand, like 1.8 thousand meters. It's, 
either put 20 or if you're trying to do tilt of it, then to 40. Um, like if you're saying that this is incorrigible in 90, but I mean, ideally you want ever you want this to be like if you want this to be 250 and you tilt, then you need to be 2,000. Now, if you do 2,000, which might actually still be viable here, to be honest, um, if you ask it, and then, and again, this is just a question, just like a very local optimization question. Um, but note that if you do 2,000 on this, look how far you need to go from the theory. Um, so you go this, and then you're shaving one, two. Um, I'm gonna try to check distances with this just because this is 66 and you think you need to go about 40. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 maybe, 16. Like, this is much more significant than demolition. Although, honestly, if it's 17 versus 11, it's not. I mean, that's not what um, big Nimby fights are made of. So, like, like you see that, like, even... So, so maybe actually this does say that you should do this. Um, and I mean, if you try to draw the same circle around green swabs, um, the problem is that you're running into the freeway. So, essentially, the only way to make it work here. So yeah, here you can, I'm, I'm imagining, and this needs to be checked environmentally, but I'm imagining that you can shave a little bit into the, um, uh, into the creek. Um, that it's not actually, that something next to a freeway is not actually gonna be that environmentally sensitive if you shave what looks like a single digit number of meters. The problem is here, and to make everything the worst possible world, um, this is a little s. Now, the fact that it's a little s essentially means that um, you're, if you're trying to do this curve here, then you go here, you build the curve first, which is what makes it more constructible. You just need to lose, I don't know, 15 houses or 20 houses are in green terms. Um, and then go here, right? And then if you line, oh wow, you're still, okay. Um, one, and then you do a tangent, it's not a tangent. And then you do something like this maybe. And I mean, not literally this, but it like, kind of, instead of making it single arc, you do, one arc, little, and then another to get to here. I mean, this actually is easier than I thought. I mean, technically easier. It does involve getting rid of houses with swimming pools, um, which always means spending money. I mean, this might be after, oh shit, this is a row house. It's not one apartment, there, there is not one house, there are a bunch of people living here. Um, so it might actually be worthwhile trying to not hit them. Uh, not out of nimbyism, but just because it's easily $10 million just for that, that one property. Um, whereas here, if this might be this, I mean, it's already here. I mean, what are they going to complain about? Um, so it's one, two, three, four, five, maybe? Six, seven, eight, nine. This is six, you know, it's the same one, so 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I can't tell that how this, this looks like multiple houses. Yeah. It's a weird setting. Um, 15, and then I don't know about what these 16. Um, it's, it's like the point of like counting things and figuring out um, what to do about green swarms. Um, and, and not just green farms, in, in general. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes you can... So anyway, this is kind of like what needs to be done for a speedo again. So it's like looking at these little things and try to 
do some kind of optimization. This is actually really good because it means that the optimization, like this kind of optimization is just writing down the time saving and suggesting approximate number of houses to be taken and then trying to figure out average housing values um, and maybe some construction costs. But, but but you notice how this bypass they drew, it's something that's not actually technically very hard. It's not be a bypass. It would just move the entire station probably. So just as kind of two steps. So you first build the bypass and that, you just re and then you build the station in the middle for here, and then you move the trains to it and recall it and take away this line. Um, and uh, here, like, I mean, when you go longer on I-95, I mean, it's more money than you spend on a Greenfield line, but um, if you carefully avoid doing annoying things like having to go elevated over the freeway, and then again, elevate it over the freeway, then that is good. Anyway, um, this also is relevant to this bridge replacement question, but I mean, the bridge has to be replaced if they keep the old alignment. So it's called Sanga, I believe it's the Sanga bridge. Um, this is walk, the, like, the, the four hard bridges are Coast Cobb, Walk, I believe this is Saga, I'm not sure. Um, and this one, I forgot it. Um, so anyway, that, that's the main decision point. And as I said, the decision, like the high speed rail project, is going to be very synthetic, but I do, but it can't just drain. I can't just draw a line and say, that is it. It needs to be more thought out. It needs to be better thought out with some kind of questions of trade offs on various curves. Um, yeah, um, the hard part is not going to be the curves. The, the curves I can draw, it's something that you, you can notice how, how I'm doing, how, how I picked one of these at random and did something even a little bit bigger. So that plus also, uh, plus also what's it called, uh, Norwalk. And I mentioned, and I just did that as kind of a mini thing on stream and not the entire stream, a short part of the stream. So I imagine like all of these combined are one day of work maybe two days of work. The hard part is going to be this and this. The big alignment questions, by the way, are big, but not actually hard. You just optimize them separately. And um, the bypass alignments on all of them, so for example, the Hartford question, there, it doesn't interact with a lot of things because there aren't a lot, there, there's no the trains between Hartford and Providence would be entirely Greenfield. New Haven to Hartford is a line that exists, but it's just one line. And it's not going to be hard to schedule around. Conversely, the I-95 version is also going to be Greenfield. So it's only going to be figuring out what to do about South County. And then again, Providence to Wakeford Junction, see earlier in the video, ridership is so low, it can just be done around high-speed trains. Um, this... This, like these are not things that require me to do the same kind of work twice. It's these are just bigger things that have the same complexity as these decisions, effectively. Well, maybe not if I'm drawing an entire line of providence, but again, this is measured in days of work, and then this is measured in days of not this, um, this, especially this, and then how it interacts with this. Baltimore is a lot easier, and then how it interacts with this, that is the real pain point. Um, it's like days just to like line bed and actually not line bed, on my couch and play video games and not think about it, as opposed to the actual, and, and then the actual work is much longer than a couple days of that. Um, like it bought, bought, the trick with Boston is because I've done so much free work for um, DM. I've actually had to think a lot about these kind of automations, so I can just tell you extemporaneously how it's going to look like. Um, the timetables are enforced in many ways anyway. Um, and there's so much separation between Boston and New York that literally one of the tricks from all these curve modification yes or no questions is going to be matching things so that based on an enforced timetable here and on a separate timetable here that they're going to match. Because... I mean, I'm drawing here like it's New York or New Haven, but it's not. Um, because the pain point, not the pain point for construction costs, the construction costs are mostly going to be 
I mean, there's going to be somewhere here and here, but construction costs are going to be highest east of Stanford because of this required tunnel plus a bunch of greenfield stuff here. Um, and of course, long greenfield even without tunnel. I mean, at the end of the day, it's 120 kilometers, a lot of money. Um, but um, the pain point for planning is entirely west of Stanford because Stanford to New Haven is far. Um, decreeing that all four tracks can be used in regular service all day, which is how things are done today, but because right now, at no point are all four tracks along the entire line used in service because one of them always has a segment that's under uh, endless repair. But that's very easy to fix. The state of good repair, the, the state of good repair con is very easy to get rid of because there's a lot of ways to automate this work and make it just so much easier. And apparently, there's something that is even done in America by the freight railroads. The freight railroads. Um, when they do things like switch installation, they don't have any cost premium over Europe. The switches are more primitive, but that's not why they don't have a cost premium. It's just, that's the switch geometry. Um, and then Metro North does that, and there's like a factor of four premium. Um, and when they fix, and when Amtrak, for example, or one of these railroads, does some work to fix turnout, to fix anything, um, they work at like an order of magnitude or even more than order of magnitude, less productivity. Um, so that might actually be something where you can use product rail orders for a little bit of help. Um, but if not, that's fine. I mean, there's European passenger railroads and their work rate. And I mean, the rail orders here can't work with it. I mean, they're replaceable. Um, people overestimate the extent to which extremely overstaffed unions are a greater point. Um, Especially when it's federal and railroads, because um, stuff like the Taylor Law and the Tribal Amendment in New York, that does not bind railroads, which are in America under pure federal, uh, under pure feder purely federal uh, jurisdiction. Um, so, for so this means that it is that it is legal for railroad workers in the state of New York, even if they are employed. By the state of New York, H E L I R, it is legal for them to strike, and it is legal for management to unilaterally you know, change the terms of a uh, uh, of a contract. I mean, the workers are allowed to strike and protest, and um, uh, and, you know, they're, they're allowed to strike and protest. But if the contract lapses, it is not auto renew, um, unless again management can management can base a strike, um, and it is not legal to do so. Um, for the rest of the public sector workforce in the state of New York, enforced in industrial peace, and also no productivity gains or wage gains whatsoever. Um, if you're underpaid as a worker, you can't go on strike. If you're overpaid or overstaffed as a worker, great, but uh, it's great for you because management can't do anything to you. Um, and that does not apply to railroads. So they're not actually a veto point. And, um, and actually trying to figure out how the so, so one of the pain points for the report is going to be how to like writing down exactly, not not just saying, oh, in Europe we use track geometry machines, which is a, which is real, but working out something that's a little bit more concrete about um, how this can be done more productively, like stuff like what appropriate maintenance intervals are, things like that, which is so appropriate maintenance intervals we absolutely can't do domestically through American railroads because American railroads are on the if it ain't broke don't fix it if it is broke, pretend it ain't broke kind of um, mentality. It's not, there's no regular intervals for preventive, main, for preventive maintenance. For example, they don't replace sleepers on a regular, they don't replace sleepers on a regular basis. The, they just see, and if the sleeper does not look broken, they don't replace it. So it's done manually. Um, same thing with car maintenance. So that means, for example, explaining Maintenance intervals is used in Germany or in France or in Japan. If I can find that, I probably can't, but I can look. Um, we could actually explain the maintenance intervals on the trains very well in Germany, but I have no idea about the tracks. Um, but do just so, so anyway, decreeing that all four tracks shall be used in regular service and the maintenance be confined to the nighttime hours that's some work to be done, but not actually a lot of work. It might. Part, and actually not a lot of work at their part at their end it's like 
probably a, a year of weekend shutdowns, and then they get a very good line where already the trip time between New York and New Haven is going to be an hour and change as opposed to an hour 40. Like, d- 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 no, seriously, you can count about 40 minutes between New York between New York City and New Haven without a year of work. I mean, more um, extra time for planning, but, like, that's how backward American railroading, especially passenger railroading, especially around New York, is. 40 minutes for a couple hundred million dollars of work. And again, probably about a year of weekend shutdowns. Um, not shutdowns of the entire line, but shutdowns of one track at a time, which are already happening. Is is the tragedy? Like all the pain, po- all of the pain points are all, all of the pain for passengers is already there. There's just nothing to show for it. So explaining how that is to be done, but is is a problem. But the real planning difficulty is is trying to fit everything together when it's local express and the local commuter express commuter and in, in intercity from Stanford to Jersey. How it interacts with through running how it interacts with a good Penn Station plan, which can be no. I mean, no build is a plan. It just needs to interact with no build. Um, and um, how to and what to do about New Rochelle is the pain point, both the reverse branch and the S-curve. And the, um, uh, not the S-curve, what did they want to say? I mean, the S-curve is also a pain point, but the flat junction. Uh, there's also a flat junction here called Hunter, um, but that's not a... That's a pain point for passenger. It's not a pain point for planning because you obviously just fix it. That's that's just what you do. Um, and there aren't even that many ways to fix it. So you just grade separate it. Grade separations, rail and rail, are kind of annoying, but they're not that expensive. Um, so it's kind of these things that, again, the pain point for me writing this plan for us the... Uh, at DCP, quality controlling it um, is going to be, I guess, Stanford. Let's let's call it Stanford to Metro Park, maybe to Stanford to New Brunswick. Past New Brunswick is easy. New York to New Brunswick is not that hard. Um, this is hard. This is hard. This is hard. This is hard. Again, planning level, planning wise, not in terms of actual cost, which is actually going to be, again, so this is 14 minutes that are practically free if someone who has heard of um, the North of the Bulk High Speed Line is put in charge, which, to be fair, does exclude all American rail orders, but includes many people who are not American rail orders. Um, cutting another, I think, 20 minutes requires all the pain points I imagine. Doing this think relative to just running faster on these cars is another half an hour maybe but um but that is money that is not just hire someone to cop it. it's just this is spent not a lot of billions but billions i think three four maybe it would be the current like like after it, it's three in the dollars of like 10 or 15 years ago it's probably it's four ish at this point maybe you can even see four and a half if the river crossings are harder than I imagine to do this. Um, not this. I mean, Greenfield goes up until about here and then hooks into Kingston. Um, this, I don't know if anything needs to be done. Um, this is one bypass. Um, I should probably mention somewhere. Um, uh, Where is oh track sharing here? Uh, Boston Providence needs another bypass. Um, Sharon or Route One Twenty Eight or both under sixty pH. Uh, then Washington Baltimore bypass over. Needs some overtakes. It is triple and not quad track. Where? 
think these are the questions. I think these are the pain points for planning. Um, again, this doesn't require me to, re to write the entire timetable for watching that. It does require me to write something that works as a timetable for sections of New York, but that's fine. Um, and yeah, and, and, and Philadelphia, but again, Philadelphia, um, I have a, I have a kind of cheat, um, which is that I, and it's, 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 it's the Philadelphia cheat is that is, is Christopher Spieler, so it's essentially the equivalent of, oh, yes, it's an adventure game, but I've already watched someone do a playthrough, and therefore I know the answer, and therefore I know how to solve all the quests. Um, that's kind of how it's like. Um, so, um, I'm going to stop here. I have 20 more minutes to take questions, um, and then I need to go. So, um, if anyone has questions, again, I'll, if people don't have questions, I'll probably go in like two minutes. If people do have questions, I will go in, again, 18, 19 minutes. Yes, the current, th these are frequencies. Yes, the current frequencies are not tacty. I think they've become tactier since this was written, but. Um, but anyway, part of the work is going to be producing these kinds of timetables for the various lines. But again, I've done the work for Boston. I've mostly done the work for New York. Like recheck some assumptions for New York, but that's not months of work. That's at most a week of work. Um, Philly, I need to talk to people, but again, other people have done this work. Oh, is Greenfield too difficult for the corridor? Yes. Upgrading is the only option. And the reason Greenfield is too difficult, so what do you mean by Greenfield? Um, where would you go Greenfield? I mean, you're not going to go Greenfield through the city of Boston. I mean, they don't do Greenfield through the city of Paris or through the inner suburbs of Paris, right? The Greenfield starts in maybe the outer suburbs of Paris. So you're not going to do Greenfield around here. You can go Greenfield around here, but first of all, remember the United States has far more horizontal fall than other parts of the world. And these are big cities. So they have, so New York has, New York is the world's largest urban area by uh, geographical uh, area, by geographical land area. Um, so, and this is a big problem with the Northeast Corridor, and this is why the default has been to run on the legacy alignment and not try to build dedicated high-speed rail at all. Um, this still constraint. I mean, it's not as big of a constraint as people think, but it is a constraint, um, and especially a constraint in the inner urban parts. Now, I'll play the inner urban. Yeah, I can. You can, I can. I don't know. Go outside here and then go on something like I ninety five and go around. Um, but why? This is good high-speed track. Um, and the other issue is also that the cities are spaced pretty closely together. Now, again, this is a, this is a place where you might still be able to hook into this, but the pain point, but but there, but this is a pain point that is not going to be bypassable. Um, there's actually something that I should probably put in big alignment question. Um, do trains use a reactivated? Reactive, reactive, it is east side rail tunnel in Providence. And the answer to that is almost certainly no. But it's fun to crayon, so why not spend a couple days on fun to crayon? Uh, so I don't think this is very visible here, but you can see this. Um, so 
the old alignment went like this. And then um, when everything got realigned here, first of all, I, I don't remember the sequence of whether they opened this first or this first, but what they ended up opening and doing is they opened a, um, they opened this alignment, so you can see the rail, and this is the tunnel. The tunnel um, happens to pass right underneath the center of College Hill, which is the intersection of uh, Thayer Street. This is not Thayer Street. This is Thayer Street with um, Angel. Like, like it, it passes underneath here or here. Um, this might look, this is a separate tunnel. It was used for streetcars and now buses. Um, so when the streetcars were removed in the 40s, this became the world's first BRT infrastructure. It was never, cars never used this tunnel. Um, I mean, maybe emergency vehicles, but um, this is a bus tunnel. Um, the rail tunnel is underneath and goes like this. And um, I'm forgetting which of these buildings is, uh, wait, I think this is the entrance. Like the entrance to the tunnel has been sealed. Um, and the Providence and the downtown Providence Park has been removed um, because the elevated lines were called the Chinese Wall, separating the city. So there was this Providence Union Station, and went like this and this, and then they uh, removed it to build what is now Providence Station, which was moved a little bit farther out, um, and with an alignment that's not as obtrusive. And uh, so do you reactivate? That is a question. I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be no. It's too expensive for very little game. The main game is going to be for commuter rail, um, just because you can have direct trains for brown, to Brown. But I mean, I don't think Brown is worth that. I like serving Brown is worth enough money to build a new tunnel. But you never know. Um, but anyway, so unless you do this, which is which still requires, which is still leveraging because it's the same track. I mean, how are you getting to Providence? I mean, if you do Greenfield, you just are bypassing Providence entirely. Like the freeways are viable alignment sometimes, but they don't get into the they don't get into the cities. The freeways that do go into the cities are not very good alignments for going into big cities. Same thing here. I mean, you can bypass, you can build a bypass, but why would the alignment already good? This is a bypass. It's not. Um, this is not legacy. I don't think it needs to be legacy. New Haven to New York, yeah, you can bypass, but I might look at I-95. Like, I, mean, I mean, you can't just do a bypass. I mean, you can. It's just not going to be a very good line. Um, because I-95 also has a lot of curves. Um, and if you're trying to do a full bypass, you're, you need to go way out. And um, and that still has some takings. That doesn't absolve you from doing takings. It makes the planning a little easier, but it makes the line, I think, slower. And yeah, there are plans to try to do full bypass, just the full bypass and the involving like a long tunnel between New Rochelle and White Plains. I think that was the Amtrak plan. And then keeping going here and doing a bunch of mountain tunneling to get to Danbury, and then from Danbury do some Greenfield alignment to or near Waterbury, and then Hartford. Like you're not serving New Haven without doing New York, New Haven. Now, yeah, there are people who think that you should do weird things like an underground, an underground, an underwater tunnel here, but that's not going to, that's horrifically expensive, and Long Island as well needs, like, it's too developed for a pure green, greenfield alignment. Um, like, the only places where a greenfield alignment, where pure greenfield alignment is viable are places where you, for the most part, don't need one. So that's the answer to the question. This is why you need to do a mostly upgraded Um, does that answer your question, Tommy? By the way, bear in mind, even with, uh, yeah, awesome, thanks. By the way, even with, um, a mostly upgraded option, like the speed, the upgrade speed is going to be pretty high. I mean, the, so New York, New Haven, so think about it. So yeah, New York Marathon in an hour is 116, I guess, 117 kilometers an hour, which blows. Um, I mean, yeah, it's faster than Polish trains, but it's slower than even German trains. I don't mean German high trains, it's slower than German, like, Berlin to, to Prague. But even with these bypasses, you're already getting to doing it in 40 minutes, maybe, I think. So 117 kilometers in 40 minutes, yeah, it's not, it's not I mean, it's 
speed that exists on German high speed lines. And yeah, this way these high speed lines suck, but I mean, this is literally the hardest part to build. Not, not to plan, but to build. Um, to plan again, the hardest part is this. To build the hardest part, this is kind of hard, but really the hardest part to build is this. Um, and um, yeah, this is also some money, but I mean, you have to plan. Like the average speed that I think I'm projecting here is very good for high speed rail. I mean, it's, it's going to be a line that's going to be just run 300 something kilometers an hour almost all the way. Um, and here also you can support pretty high average speed. You can do this in probably 22 ish minutes. Um, maybe 23 if the, if, the, if the end curves are worse than I'm thinking. But I mean, 23 minutes for a line that's 70 kilometers. <laughs> this would be the fastest train in Germany. Um, and this would not be the same average speed. This would be... Okay, I never remember the thing. I just remember the overall. So. This is 175. This is doable in a lot less than an hour. This is doable in... I want to say 35 minutes. It's 360 kilometers. Like more, it's like know, 37 or something. Like, this can be done in an extremely fast line. Um, so, how might Amtrak get support? How might Amtrak, okay, so first of all, the fund, so bear in mind that the plan will have a price tag, and the price tag is going to be about an order of magnitude lower than the current plans, while being faster, because the current plans already value engineer a lot of the speed away. Um, uh, how might Amtrak get funding for these bypasses? It's going to be a federal thing. Also, it's entirely possible that this is not going to be a Wilmington bypass. Um, and that's the only bypass that leads to trains going through a state without serving it. So the other bypasses, like some bypasses in Maryland, for example, I mean, they're bypasses around places that are never going to get stations. Um, so the bypasses, yeah, you're bypassing some unserved towns in Maryland in order to give people in Maryland faster trains to Philadelphia and New York. Um, the bypass, uh, like a bypass between New Haven and Kingston uh, does cut off Old Sabre, which first of all, um, the limiting factor here is uh, bridge openings on our Connecticut. And so it means that there's just gonna be more regional service. So these people do get way better service. Um, and also, again, it gives people in the state of Connecticut, also people who live in New London because no one can get a, a high-speed rail station here, vastly faster trains to New York and Boston. I mean, this is not relevant for New Haven to New York, but this is absolutely relevant for New Haven to Boston. Um, again, Wilmington is the question mark. Wilmington is also a bypass that I think might technically turn out to be not great anyway. Um, like, that's literally the only place where trains would go through a state without serving it. Um, and yeah, there's a valid reason not to do that. Much more valid than when the Berlin to Munich high-speed line was moved from serving Gera, I think. I never remember if Gera or Vienna, to serving Erfurt. Um, does that answer your question, Sunny? I mean, honestly, my guess is that the Wilmington bypass, again, it, I'm going to work out both. Um, unless it turns out that, so, so in, the, in the situation, which I think is the likeliest, okay, if the bypass is technically not good, like so too much money for not little benefit, whatever. If it is excellent, yeah, you do it. If it, which I suspect might actually happen, is that it is about neutral or only slightly positive, it ends up being a political decision. Um, like, bypassing a state without serving it is a political decision. Um, the fact that the Biden is from Wilmington, I think, matters a little bit. Like, it eventually is going to be, like, a plan where everything is signed off and someone is going to ask, like, if this is actually, you know, you know, if this plan is actually adopted by anyone, which are 
blustery design was not. But if it is, the, a, a, if people want to adopt it, I'm guessing that in like 24, 25, Secretary Buttigieg comes to President Biden and says, okay, I have a plan, just the, um, um, just a, uh, just Mr. President, do we, are, are we okay with having express trains uh, bypass Wilmington or not? And it's going to be just a yes, no decision, you know, or like a one pager, I think it's going to be. Um, again, the rest, I mean, the, the, like the lowest level at which, at which um, local, in which locality is relevant is the state. Like, like not, not the state is in, um, the, not the state is in Lita or, or, or that. I mean, like, I, I mean, U.S. state, like the 50 states. Um, are there other questions in our last three minutes, three to four minutes? Gonna give it one more minute. Like if if when the clock turns nine fifty eight, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'm gonna just close this. Um. So yeah, this is for the Northeast Carter. I mean, if it's easier than I think it is to plan, then the plan won't just be about like I might spend more time on commuter rail issues, or I might more, spend more time on tight ends like Philly to Harrisburg or America to Albany or something. Um. But um, it's it like I mean, we're deadlined to early twenty four. We can we can extend it away a little bit. We can't extend it by a lot. Um, so it's essentially the stuff that can be planned by early twenty four and presented in mid twenty twenty four at the latest. I don't think we're going to run over. I mean, if it, if we do it because it's not because research took too long. It's because writing took so long. Um, and at this point, I don't think I need to. Especially advanced scheduling software, which is very good. Um, essentially, I'm trying to make my life easier by taking these. Like, if you literally look at every decision point here, it's like going to be a six-figure number of options, and reducing them to something that's actually doable by a human, um, and reducing how they interact. So that's the plan for high-speed rail. It's doable. I don't know what the Cost figure is going to be. It's going to be one of the things that the that he's going to say. I can make guesses because I have done a little bit of that work already. I'm guessing it's going to be in 2022 dollars. I don't know. High teens, maybe. Um, it would have been low to mid teens in the dollars of 10 years ago, but there's been inflation since. So thank you everyone uh, for doing it, and remember that. Next week, there is no stream. Uh, next week, uh, again, there is uh, this, the webinar. Please do go. Um, so thank you, and I will see you at the webinar. And on the stream, I will presumably see you uh, in two weeks. Ciao, ciao.